Hi everyone, this is Carol Hinkle, President of Triple E. I want to welcome everyone today to this, our fourth lecture. This topic is very timely. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. I'm excited. So I'd now like to introduce Beth Wood, our program chair, who will give us a little background about our speaker. Beth? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome back to Triple E, Peter Hans Matthews. Uh, Dr. Matthews earned his bachelor's degree at McGill, his master's at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and his PhD at Yale. He joined in 1995 the faculty of Middlebury College, where he is currently the Charles A. Dana Professor of Economics. He also serves as a distinguishing visiting professor at Aalto University in Helsinki, Finland. Please join me in welcoming back to Tripoli, Dr. Peter Hans Matthews. Hi, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be back. I'm hoping that everyone can see the slides over my left shoulder, right shoulder, one of those shoulders. Um, as Beth said, this is a, a, a return visit for me. I think the last time I was here, I was talking to all of you about Canadian politics. So this makes a big change. Um, but I, as I said, I, I hope that if any of you have any questions in this kind of really different format that you either ask me at the end, or if we don't have time at the end, please feel absolutely free to reach out to me. My email address is on the, on the cover slide here. And I have a web page, and I'm pretty easy to find. So, all right, so let's get started. I'm, I want to start with an observation. And the observation is this. We live in an age of, of fake news, and even when the news isn't fake, uh, it can be customized or tailored to, to, to fit exactly the preferences of people who are like us. Um, and so we have this kind of real splintering effect. And the irony is, is that in the midst of all of this, we have never lived in an age in which there is as much high quality publicly available data as there is right now. There are enormous opportunities for people to become engaged citizens. And in fact, in much of the world, engagement with that kind of data is considered a form of civic engagement. All of the data and all of the data I'm going to show to you today is publicly available. It comes from, and most of it, almost all of it comes from three sources. And, um, and all of it, is, all of it is, is material or data that any of you could engage with on your own. I'm going to walk you through a bunch of pictures today, but in some ways you could do this on your own and you could engage one another about this on your own. There's no reason that we can't enjoy fact-based conversations with one another. I'll just mention where the three sets of data come from just so that you have a sense. So the first is from this really remarkable project called the Opportunity Insight Project, uh, Insights Project at, at Harvard led by an economist named Raj Chetty. So the, the project has many dimensions, but of late, one of the things that they've been doing is they've been, in a sense, creating an alternative to, to, to publicly available uh, government data that is real time. That is to say, they figured out a way to collect data on things like employment or small business activity in real time by partnering with private groups like uh, uh, credit card processing agencies or job finders. And one of the things that they're able to do is they're able to give us a, gl a, gl a, gl a glimpse at what's happening to the economy as we speak. So if you want to know what happened to unemployment, not last month, but in some ways last week, uh, uh, the Chetty Group is, is doing remarkable work. The other set of, most of the other pictures I'm going to show you come from something called Our World in Data, which if you just Google Our World in Data, you'll see it. This is probably the best resource available to any of us in terms of thinking about COVID-related data. They also provide useful guidelines. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at that. The last comes from a very old source, but in some ways an underused one. Our own Federal Reserve Bank has a, something called FRED, which is the kind of the Federal Reserve's economic database. And that's available if you just type FRED, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. So I just want to say that almost everything I'll show you is a picture. Almost all of, all of it is publicly available. And almost all of it, I think, would be interesting to you even without me. So in some ways, I'm, I'm here to facilitate a conversation that I, I hope will last a much longer time. All right, so let's start with a, a first picture. So what are we looking at here? So we're looking at employment since the very announcement of the first COVID case in the United States on January 20th uh, of, of this year. And so the way to interpret this picture is to say on the on the horizontally, as we move from left to right, what you're looking at are various uh, time with various important dates marked out. National emergency declared, the CARES Act enacted, the first stimulus payments made. 
up and down what you see is how much total employment in the United States has changed relative to what it was on January 20th. So that's why on January 20th it's zero. You see just after that it goes up a little bit. And then you see what we all observed, namely the crash of employment uh, uh, post uh, the de declaration of the national emergency and post the kind of uh, a spread of the virus. I want to say, and we'll see a little bit uh, uh, later, that this is not just a decline. It's a decline of absolutely historic proportions. At one point, the evidence suggested that employment in the United States had declined as much as 20% or more. What you also see, however, is the beginnings of a recovery. There are a couple of things to note about this, though, that we're going to talk about a little bit more, which is that the recovery, while it's happening, has in some sense petered out a little bit. And that's consistent with some of the data we saw even today. What we saw were some additions to, to total jobs, but that that was happening at an increasingly slow rate. And so where are we now relative to where we were at the start? Well, you see up here, we're about six or seven percent uh, lower employment. Does that sound like a lot? It is when you think that the total, uh, the total labor force in the United States is about 150 million people. That's many millions of people who are not employed now who might have been otherwise. So that's the first picture I wanted to show you. The next one is the same picture with a somewhat longer view. And it's a reminder that, in fact, it's not enough to recover to where we were in, in, in January of this year. Because you, as you take a look at this picture, the blue part of this picture is precisely where the previous picture starts. And one of the things you see is that in, in a dynamic economy like the United States, the American economy with employment growing steadily over time because the labor force and population is growing steadily over time, we would expect employment to grow pretty steadily. And that's indeed what we see. So when we say that we haven't recovered relative to where we were in January 20, uh, in January, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so we left off at this picture. By the way, that was that was not me hitting a random button. That was the internet. Um, and that happens from time to time. So I hope I hope we're okay. All right. So taking a look at where we were last time, you see that we're sort of behind where we were in terms of thinking about long run growth, and that's a problem. Um, and it's a problem because as you take a look at this. Um, you see that employment growth has been increasing. We saw that in, in, in this morning's announcement, but it's been increasing at a decreasing rate. That is to say, we're recovering, but the rate of which we're recovering seems to be slowing down. And that's disconcerting. Uh, that's disconcerting because for one thing, it doesn't, it's not obvious when in some ways we're going to make up all of this lost ground. But more important, it suggests that there are a lot of us still in distress. And in fact, we see that in terms of unemployment numbers and we see that in terms of the situation of very specific groups. And so one of the other things that this picture points out though, someone reminded me this morning is, this is a, a picture that gives the lie to a story that went around a lot, even in Vermont, which was that we needed to be careful about things like $600 unemployment insurance uh, uh, benefits or premia, because those were considered a disincentive to work. One of the really interesting things about this picture is that it shows that we were adding new jobs, adding new employment at precisely the time when that $600 was in place. And then when it disappeared, the rate has slowed down. I'm not saying there's cause and effect there, but if you're going to make an argument that, in fact, there are huge disincentive effects built into the previous pandemic unemployment insurance plan, the data isn't really hugely supportive. Let's take a look at that. This is the picture I really wanted to start with though today and really bring your attention to and you could you could look at this on the Opportunity Insights website very quickly. So the blue line is the line we just saw. This is total employment in the United States overall. The red line is total employment for high wage workers in the United States. I'm not gonna say highly skilled and I'm not gonna say highly educated because those aren't all quite the same thing, but I'll call them high wage workers. The green line is the same figure, but for low wage workers. And what's disturbing about this picture is, while it is certainly true that from a, from a health perspective and from an economic perspective, we're all in this together there's a sense in which those burdens are just not anything like equally shared. If you look at the experience of high wage workers, 
it's not a huge exaggeration to say that for high wage workers, the recession is basically over. For low wage workers, low wage work employment is still 20% below where it was some time ago. In a sense, the recession has been catastrophic for low wage workers. And you might think, well, that that's always the case. But in fact, I'm going to show you that this is much more extremely the case than, than, than it has been in, in, in previous years. What we really have now is what some people, I, I know many people have heard about V-shape and U-shape and L-shape recoveries. Some people are not talking about a K-shape recovery, where well-to-do workers are basically on the road to recovery and, and, and low wage workers are simply still in desperate, in, in desperate straits. I just want to show you that this looks exactly the same in, in Vermont. So this is exactly the same data as we just looked at, but in Vermont, in Vermont, you see the same, I mean, it's still the case in Vermont that high wage workers are not quite as well off as they were in January, 2020, but low wage workers are desperately much less well off, right? Employment is still a 25 or 30, almost 26% lower than it was at the, at the in January, uh, January, 2020. So that case K shaped recession we were talking about is really pronounced in the state of Vermont. And even those employment numbers are a little bit misleading. So this is a number you don't often see reported, but I thought I'd share with you. So a lot of people in the United States, uh, especially at the lower end of the income distribution, hold a, what is now called a portfolio of jobs. Right? Once upon a time, many, full, many, many heads of household in the United States held full-time single jobs. That's less and less the case. What we now often see are lots of folks cobbling together multiple jobs. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with that, except that from a point of view of thinking about measuring and thinking about economic performance, when somebody loses one of the two jobs that they use in order to support a family, they're still counted as employed. And when that person comes back to work to, the, to a second job, for example, that doesn't get recorded either in, in, in the usual sense. And what I'm showing you here from the Federal Reserve is a look at the number of Americans who are portfolio job holders, who hold multiple jobs. And one of the things you see is that that's not recovered yet, right? That one of the things that happened in the, in the onset of the, on, in the, on, uh, on the onset of the, the COVID epidemic was a collapse, not just in employment, but in the number of jobs that people hold who hold multiple jobs. And that hasn't recovered. So one of the things we're looking at when we look at that K-shaped recovery is we're looking at a lot of folks who not only lost jobs, but a lot of poor folk who basically lost a second or a third job. Right? And that has consequences for the way you think about policy too. This is just this kind of evidence I was suggesting before that in some ways you look at four previous recessions and the one thing that's true of previous recessions is yes, uh, uh, low wage workers tend to do a little bit less well off in every recession, but this one is different. This one is absolutely different. This is the sense in which, as I said before, we're, we're not all in this together. Low wage workers have been frankly brutalized by, 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 by the epidemic, which is why the, some of the, the, the federal budget policies are so important to the kind of current conversation. Let me show you one other thing. One of the places you see this is, the, is, is in, in the data on COVID and race. So let's think about this a little bit. Low wage workers have been especially hardly hit during the current recession. What does that mean? It means that low wage workers, the low wage workers who, who keep their jobs are often working in so-called essential sectors. The low wage workers who lose their jobs often return to, uh, to residences and to, to, to cities and to neighborhoods that are densely populated. They often find themselves with reduced access to medical care. And so not surprisingly, one of the consequences of the economic effect here is for there to be a differential health effect. And what you're looking at here are uh, uh, early days death rates for different populations in New York City. And the top diagram is the is the unadjusted by age. So notice, you know, you would expect, for example, that uh, 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 because one population may be on average older than the other, that COVID death rates would be higher. And that's roughly right here. So what, what, what you want to see when you look at this picture is that uh, the white population is uh, somewhat older. It's the oldest of the four groups in New York. And so its COVID death rate actually is was surprisingly low given its age distribution. 
whereas the death rates of blacks and African Americans was on average three times higher than it was for white workers in New York City. That's one of the consequences of that K-shaped recession I was talking about a second ago. Um, it's a recession that hits poor workers disproportionately uh, hard is a recession that almost by definition hits black workers and Hispanic workers relatively hard. And so we want to think a little bit about that. I, you know, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to, this is a kind of un, unemployment insurance claims. There's not a lot here that's going to surprise anyone here. I'm, maybe I'm just going to skip over this a little bit. I do want to talk about this though. So what I'm looking at here is not employment, but using the same Opportunity Insights website, there's percentage change in consumer spending. So if you're thinking about you know, economic health, you really want to spend time thinking about consumer spending, right? Consumer spending is 70 or 75% of total spending. It's going to be essential to any recovery and it's going to be a, probably a driver uh, of, the, of the economy for the next year or two. And so you see a couple of things here pretty dramatically. One of the things you see here is that consumption spending is still lower than it was uh, pre-COVID. It's about four or five percent lower than it was. You also see a couple of other things though. You see very dramatically the effect of the stimulus payments. Right? There's a lot of talk about whether or not the stimulus was effective or not. If you look at the, the, the dotted line right about here, right, sort of uh, April 18th or so, you see a sharp spike in consumption spending. In fact, the largest growth in consumption spending since then. That wasn't when anything was passed. It wasn't when any, anything was announced. It was in fact when the first checks went out. There's a very real sense in which a, a, a federal government policy, fiscal policy, has been completely successful in propping up consumption spending at a time when employment was collapsing. And that's really important to know. On the other hand, consumption spending has not recovered. And I'm going to show you something that I think is going to surprise you a little bit. So now I'm going to show you consumption spending by the same groups we were looking at when we were looking at employment. And here's what's interesting. Here's, here's what's surprising. The green line you're looking at is consumption spending by the same low income workers who were much more likely to lose their jobs. And one of the things you see is that until now, at least, policy has been relatively good about propping up the consumption or household spending of relatively low income workers. What's really interesting about the current recession, and again, it's a little bit unusual, is that the collapse in consumption spending has all been by high income workers. So in effect, what we have is the following. We have a recession in which relatively high income workers are hanging on to their jobs, but they're not spending as much as they used to. They're, but they're not spending as much as they used to on the sorts of things our previous picture suggests, that were typically provided by low-income workers. So it may or may not come as a huge shock to you, but all of the kinds of in-person services that were typically provided by low-income workers to high-income workers in the United States, that market has disappeared. Right? But interestingly, the collapse in, 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 in demand for goods and services in the United States is not coming from low-income workers. The collapse in demand is coming from high-income workers who typically have not experienced a collapse in their income, are often working from home, but they're simply not spending. And that raises a really interesting policy question. And you can see this, by the way, in, in, this, in the behavior of the three groups immediately after the stimulus payments, right? Low-income workers were clearly, in some sense, saved by the stimulus payments. That's the green line. You see a huge spike in, in, in consumption spending. Whereas the red line, it bumps up, but not nearly by as much. One of the really curious things about this is the strange patterns it produces in spatial patterns, geographic patterns in consumption behavior and income behavior in the United States. So for example, it, it's the case, generally speaking, that uh, a no group of poor workers in the United States has fared worse than those workers who, lived, who live adjacent to relatively affluent neighborhoods. So if you look at New York, for example, if you live if you're a poor worker who lives relatively close to the Upper West Side, you've on balance done much worse than a poor worker who lives, for example, in Brooklyn or the Bronx. And so we see this interesting collapse in spending, and it's a collapse in spending that's largely driven by high income workers. That's going to be really important to understanding why some kinds of policies don't work. Right. And why the opening up, for example, policies may not may or may not be super successful. So I want you to keep that in mind as we keep going. <clears throat> 
this is just in some sense to kind of capture the intuition. So this is consumer spending on different kinds of goods. And yes, as we just, uh, as we just suggested, uh, uh, spending on, on restaurants and hotels, spending on entertainment, spending on food, spending on all sorts of other things has basically collapsed. Other sorts of spending have basically picked up. I, I thought I'd share these two, two because there's another way in which this recession has not been, uh, the burdens of this recession have not been equally shared. So we said before that total spending has gone is still down about five or six percent relative to to what it was pre-COVID, but the collapse in small business revenue is much larger than that. Small business has borne a disproportionate share of 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 the burdens here, and to the extent that things like payroll protection acts were not very successful at reaching out to small business, that policy has to be considered something of a failure. Uh, this is Vermont. In fact, uh, Vermont, the collapse of small business revenue has been even larger, almost 30% relative to pre-COVID peak. Uh, you might ask, an well, interesting question might be, is this because every small business out there simply has fewer customers, or is it because effectively what we're seeing is a, a shuttering of lots of small businesses where the remaining small businesses basically pick up whatever, whatever demand is left over? In, in the language of economics, that's the difference between an extensive and intensive margin. And the next picture I'm going to show you is the number of small businesses, which gets at the question of, of why we're seeing the collapse in revenue. And this is what you see. The number of small businesses open has cratered by almost a quarter. So we see a collapse in small business revenue. That's collapse in small business revenue is largely driven by the shuttering of small businesses, not by uh, uh, some kind of equal sharing across the board. And that's another sense in which the economics of COVID are, are have to have to talk about unequal distribution of burden or unequal distribution of pain here. Um, I, I'm only going to show you this picture because I've, I've been you know I've been a terrible economist, right? I've been nothing but grim today. And um, this is this is a, a picture about how people are spending their time post COVID. The green line is time spent in the workplace, and not surprisingly, that's down. Uh, the red line isn't labeled. I'm not sure why, but I'll tell you what it is. And actually, you can think about guessing what it is. It's time spent outdoors. It turns out that one of the really interesting, happy byproducts of all of this is a kind of a renewed appreciation for the for the natural environment. Um, people have have. Well, Vermonters probably didn't need to fall in love once again with 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 nature, but lots of people have, um, and that actually tracks in another study I'm doing uh, um, in terms of attitudes about the environment. Often in a recession, lots of other kind of causes, pro-social causes, are are crowded out, and that turns out to be not true for the environment in, in during that kind of uh, pandemic, and that may be one consequence of this. All right, so when we talk about policy, right? So what can we do for, for policy? I'm gonna show you two states here, and I don't wanna spend too much time on this because I wanna make a couple of other more nuanced points, but there's a lot of talk about how opening or early or late is going to benefit economic growth and save the economy and save those jobs that we're talking about. So here I'm showing you a picture for two states. So this is Minnesota and Wisconsin, who as you can see before either of them closed had very, very similar changes in consumer spending. Shouldn't be surprised, part of a broader Midwest economy, same larger macroeconomic forces at play, same sources of kind of economic expansion or, or growth, same uh, vulnerability to kind of uh, uh, swings of agricultural markets. And you see just before both of them closed that in, you know, demand starts to collapse and that's exactly the picture that we saw before. And then you see as both of them have collapsed that, 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 that uh, consumer spending now is much lower than it was, although the, uh, the decrease is sort of becoming smaller over time. But here's that, what I want you to notice. The timing of the opening was largely irrelevant to the subsequent path of the, eco of the economy. Right? If you take a look at this picture, Minnesota opens well before Wisconsin. But if you were to look at the the, the, pick, the behavior over time of consumption spending in Minnesota or Wisconsin, they look almost identical. In fact, it's in some ways you could argue that uh, uh, if there was any effect here, the effect was health, uh, right? I mean, the, 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 the keeping it closed longer probably saved lives, but there were no economic consequences. And if you go back to the previous picture I showed you, you start to understand why. Remember that most of the collapse in consumer spending is driven by relatively affluent households. 
relatively affluent households were not going to start spending again on the sorts of things they were spending before simply because an, a, a state opens up. I mean, just to, to, to think about this in kind of completely personal terms, right? It doesn't matter whether or not Burlington Airport is open at this point. There's no universe in which I'm getting on a plane. And it doesn't matter whether the destination state is particularly open at this point. There's no universe in which I'm getting on a plane. And so to the extent that the pandemic remains in place, it's, most economists think it's impossible that we're going to see a full economic recovery. So this notion of a trade-off, and I'm going to come back to over and over again, it's a really important lesson, and if we have one big lesson today, of a trade-off between, okay, you know, can we have a little bit more economic growth at the expense of a few more deaths or vice versa, is I think a false trade-off. At the very least, it's not anywhere in the data. So I'm going to show you another couple of versions of pictures like this, but this is a really important picture to keep in the back of, back of your mind, and this comes from, from Raj Chetty's work at Opportunity Insights. You see the same thing here. So if you think that Minnesota and Wisconsin are exceptions, this is a very this is a picture that does it for every state, synchronizes days of open, uh, opening and closing, and the behavior of early closing and late closing states looks the same. From an, from an economic standpoint, delaying closure or not delaying closure made little difference. From a health standpoint, it made an enormous difference. But from an economic standpoint, it didn't make a lot of difference. So this is a complicated picture. It's going to take me a minute or two to explain it, but I love this picture. This doesn't come from Opportunity Insights. This comes from a really wonderful paper by um, an economic historian. That's, that's kind of a profession you may not have heard of. Emil Werner at, at MIT. So Emil is one of those people who was fascinated by the possible connections between COVID and the Spanish flu of 1918. And like all good economic historians, he's collecting this unbelievably uh, uh, unusual new data. And what he has is data on a lot of American cities uh, between 1914 and 1919. Okay, and so on this picture, what you're looking at is on the horizontally, as you move from left to right, you're looking at mortality during the Spanish flu, the Spanish flu epidemic in, in 1918 up and down on the vertical axis, you're looking at employment from before the pan, from, from before the Spanish flu epidemic to after. So notice, if you thought there was a trade-off, you wouldn't expect to see this kind of a relationship. Because what do we see? We see generally that these two things move in the opposite direction. When one goes up, the other goes down. So let's translate that into, into kind of economics language. Other things being equal, higher mortality is associated with lower employment growth. So at some level, that's not hugely surprising, except when I tell you that the difference between the green states, sorry, the green cities and the red cities in that diagram is precisely the difference today between uh, 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 states with mask ordinances and state with not, without mask ordinances. The green cities in the picture are, 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 are cities that had a, a strong non, what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs. And what I want you to note, and the red states were not. So think about the green cities as cities that had, you know, aggressive mask ordinances, aggressive social distancing ordinances, which they did, and the red, as the, and the red, the red cities is not. Notice you see two things here. First of all, you see the green ones are all to the left of, 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 to the, of, of the reds, which tells you what? It tells you that, not surprisingly, those ordinances work, they reduce mortality. It also tells you, by and large, that those green cities experience faster growth after the fact. In fact, not only are the green cities to the left, they're also typically above that line, which tells you that they experience more employment growth than you would normally expect given that relationship. So if the Spanish flu is telling us anything, and I, you know, I'm, I'm as ambivalent about those comparisons as anyone, but if the Spanish flu is, is telling us anything, it's telling us that those sorts of non-pharmaceutical in, interventions, even pre-vaccine interventions, may in fact contribute to long-run economic growth, not deter it. Right? That's a really important lesson. We see the same thing through internationally. So, so the, what you're looking at here, this comes from Our World in Data. This is a lovely picture from Our World in Data. So again, you know, all of this 
requires just a kind of a little bit of, of thinking about, okay, what's being pictured? So again, from left to right here, I'm seeing GDP growth relative to the previous year. So, so from second quarter uh, 2019 to second quarter 2020. So the further right we are, the better off the, economies, the, the economy of the country is doing. Right, now notice all the numbers are negative because everyone contracted, but still, the further to the right you are, the closer you are to basically having had no effect. As before, the up and down, we're looking at our confirmed deaths per million. And notice, I, I, I often do this with students, and I, I maybe should have done this with you before I showed you the picture. If you believe that there was a trade-off, a trade-off between getting the economy started and accepting a little bit of, 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 of COVID deaths, what would you have expected to see? If you close your eyes, I think I can convince you that what you would have expected to see is a kind of a, the points all crowded in the northeast and southwest. That is to say, a kind of rising line here, right? That would be better growth, but more death. But what you see when you see this picture is exactly the opposite. Globally, what we see is that countries that typically have experienced more successful economic growth during this difficult year are the ones that had lower deaths per million. And you see where the U.S. here, the U.S. is, I mean, the, the U.S. Is really even really has experienced more deaths relative to other countries that have experienced similar growth, but it doesn't change away from the, the, the kind of core story that we're looking at here. And I'll show you one, one version of this, partly because I spent a lot of time in, in, in Finland. So this is the same picture looking at Europe. And some people are saying, well, apart from Sweden, we can talk about the odd Swedish case. What's going on here? There's something Scandinavian going on here, right? Finland, Norway, and Denmark are all countries that have experienced both relatively low death rates, but also relatively mild economic contractions. And we talk a little bit about what policies in those countries look like during the question and answer period. I, I mean, it's something I know a little bit about too. So, if we're, going to, if we're going to support us, ourselves with policies, one of the questions I often hear people talk about is, yeah, but you know, we've run huge deficits. Uh, we have a central bank that's intervening like crazy. Aren't we going to have to pay some terrible price for this down the road? And uh, the we're going to pay a terrible price down the road, folks will say, well, take a look at a picture like this. So this, this, says, uh, this picture shows you over time what the share of, of debt, public debt, national debt to, to GDP to income is. So right now, for example, the U.S. national debt is about 100% of total income, is equal to total income. And you think, well, okay, that's a lot. But I'd, I'd, not, I'd, I'd, I'd urge you to look at a couple of things that at this picture before you jump to any two very dramatic conclusions. First of all, we haven't added to it nearly as much as people might think. And secondly, I'm going to show you the next picture. It's still not as high as it has been historically. It's projected to be about 108% of GDP in 2021. Let's say next year, once we've absorbed the worst of this. That's about where it was in the Second World War. And I say that precisely because the period of time after the Second World War is precisely regarded as the golden age of economic growth. Right? You may think that debt burdens are going to just crush us all and, and, and make it impossible to grow. But if you think that, this is one of the nice things about interacting with data, you would have to explain how it was that for a very long period of time, for roughly 40 years after the Second World War, we grew fairly steadily, much faster than we're growing these days, despite the so-called debt overhang. So there may... There may be a story there, but the story that somehow we have debt that we've never experienced before and that's going to crush us as an economy, just it, it doesn't make historical sense. I'll show you one or two other pictures in the middle. So the other version of this you see is, well, you know, how are, how are we selling all this debt? And some part of it is, and this is often the part that seems to alarm big chunks of the, the public and, 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 and others, is that um, our own central bank is buying it effectively, direct, indirectly. And why is that a problem? Well, so how do central banks pay for this? Well, effectively, they print money, right? That's the one thing that central banks can do. And so some people have wondered whether or not 
the central bank, the Federal Reserve in this country, is effectively monetizing, creating a huge increase in, in, in money that's going to come back and haunt us all someday when they buy up all of this debt. And in fact, if you're worried about increases in the supply of money, this is a picture that scares the, scares the hell out of you. This is the total, so from the Federal Reserve standpoint, an asset is something that they bought. So when they buy government bonds, for example, or they engage in quantitative easing, it shows up here. And you see even more than the financial crisis of 2008, the Federal Reserve has very aggressively participated in, 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 in financial markets and asset markets, and is holding a lot of government debt on its books. And it's effectively paid for that by printing money. And if there's, you know, I, I, one of the interesting things about doing a lot of these kinds of lectures is uh, if there's a single kind of hardcore economic truth that people think they know, it's that printing a lot of money causes inflation. So that's why the next picture I'm going to show you is a little kooky. And I'm sorry, it's the least clear picture, and it was the only one that had both of them. But the, the, the uh, blue line here is inflation. Inflation is at an absolute historic low, relative for so well, relative to many decades anyway. Despite printing all of that money, despite putting all of that money out there, despite monetizing huge parts of the, the government's debt, we haven't seen an increase in prices. In fact, the central bank has gone out of its way to say, we would like inflation to be higher. And we're willing to tolerate more inflation in an effort to kind of bring the economy out of, out of the current recession. If more money causes higher prices, more inflation, the record of the last 10 or 15 years is, a, is, is, is almost impossible to explain. Inflation is for sure a real issue, but we need a better story about it, both as a public and sometimes in economics. The other red line there is sometimes called the real interest rate. So, um, so when I borrow money, when you borrow money for a mortgage, right? You say, okay, I borrow money at three or four percent. Well, in a world in which prices are going up five or six percent and everything's going up five or six percent, including your wages, in some sense, you're paying back less in real terms than you're borrowing. So we call that the real interest rate. So why does that matter? It matters because right now the federal government is able to borrow at negative real interest rates. Right. Yes, the federal government is taking on a lot of debt, in some sense, to keep the economy propped up and to deal with this K-shaped recession. But it's able to borrow at negative rates. It's able to borrow in a way that actually requires it to pay back less in real terms than it borrowed. If one was going to take on a lot of debt, this was absolutely the time to do so. Negative uh, in Real interest rates are negative now. They're expected to remain negative for a period of time. Um, and so, from a from a, from a prudential standpoint, this is a this is this is a good time to borrow. It's a good time to borrow. And I'm going to show you one more picture, and then I'm going to be done with a few minutes to spare, and then we're going to have some good questions. Um, so this is consumer confidence, and I'm I'm showing you this picture because um, it looks like at some level consumer confidence has cratered, and at some level, yes, it has relative to its its 19. <laughs> Uh, 19 or early 1920 peak, and that's really quite concerning. And yet, consumer confidence remains higher now than it did in 2012, than it did throughout the entire financial crash of, 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 of 2007, 8, and 9. And so I see this picture as a kind of a reason for some optimism. I see consumers looking even in the midst of the current recession, the deepest recession since the Great Depression, and retaining some measure of confidence that things are actually going to get better. I think they're right, actually. I think they're right. I'm, I'm more optimistic than some about what we're going to look like in a, in, 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 in a, year, in a year or two. And some part of that is honestly, um, you know, the experience of having lived by and large, in, in Vermont and Finland. Um, it's, it's, it's very hard not to be proud to be a Vermonter in the current economic climate, precisely because we're dealing with this in the most grown up possible way. That is to say, we're fighting the pandemic first. We're going to do as well, we, as, well as we can, recognizing that we're setting the foundation for kind of economic growth to, to, to occur later on. And the same is true of my experience, frankly, in, 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 in Finland, uh, where the population has accepted all sorts of measures 
um, in order to kind of track uh, and trace more effectively, in order to isolate more effectively, and is willing to do that precisely because they understand that this kind of trade-off between you know death versus economic growth is a false trade-off. So I think I'm going to I'm going to end there uh, with a with a we got this from a, from a, a picture that comes from VPR. So I'm happy to turn to the Q and A unless somebody would prefer that I not. Or Beth or Carol can ask me not to if they don't want to. Let's see. All right. I'm going to go. Let me. Can, I can, I'll go backwards just because. Yeah, I have no reason for frontwards or backwards. So, um, so one person asked, "What could or should be done now financially to assist those who have suffered most in this pandemic, and what should be?" done to prevent this trend in future crisis? So it's a great question. Um, the good news is we've done until now pretty well. As I showed you before, consumption spending by the lowest income households in the United States actually recovered, but that was largely because we were making very large transfers to those households. What's just, and, and I'll add a number of other couple of things. Um, actually, let me add one thing that does, doesn't often get talked about in a kind of macro setting which is uh, we were pretty good at, at, at preventing eviction for a period of time, right? Those of you who've read Matthew Desmond's absolutely remarkable book, Infected, will know that eviction policy in general is a kind of a, can be a source of poverty in, 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 in the United States. And there are two things to be really concerned about right now, right? We're seeing what we think is the beginning of a second wave. There is no emergency uh, 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 pandemic draw the emergency or additional unemployment insurance uh, uh, funds that we were making available to folks have also disappeared. And the CDC's moratorium, effective moratorium on eviction seems likely to be challenged. So I would say this, I would say what we could or should do now is a version of what we've been doing so far. The $2.2 trillion bill that just passed the House goes some distance to doing that. But I will also say that absent that support, the economy is in terrible danger. Right, so that's, let me, so that's one question. Let me, I saw, next one is early in the lecture, you compared high earners versus low, and you were talking about how having multiple jobs had an effect on spending. Do you have average numbers of jobs for each of these groups? Uh, great question. And the answer is, uh, off the top of my head, I cannot tell you the precise numbers, but I will tell you the following, which is that multiple job holding is much more common among low income households than high income households. Um, and some part of that is the kind of the increase in what some people refer to as kind of precarious labor, right? There are a lot increasingly uh, low and middle low income households are cobbling livelihoods together by holding two and three jobs. And that's always been a, a, a challenge for it's one of the ways in which interpreting data has become harder, right? So now, here's what's interesting. When a recession hits, right? In the old days, when a recession hit and you lost your job, you showed up as being unemployed. Now, when a recession hits and you lose one of your two jobs, you're no longer considered unemployed. And in fact, we don't have a measure that says, okay, you're sort of half employed. And so one of the things that I, I want people to be mindful of as they hear the unemployment data, uh, data reported today is that it's probably, it's understanding the extent to which people are still without their quote unquote desired number of jobs. I'll, I'll say one other thing about today's unemployment rate data because people have asked me about that uh, on several other uh, forums, which is unemployment rate data is also sensitive to who's being counted as being in or not in the labor force. So let me give you an example. Today, the, the data suggests that the total number of women in the labor force went down. Number of women working with was actually down. Despite that, the unemployment rate for women was also counted as going down. And you say, well, how can that be? And the answer is a substantial number of women who were previously counted as unemployed, but searching and therefore in the labor force are now being counted as being outside the labor force, no longer actively looking. And so even though the total number of women actually working was down, it increased as a fraction of the total number of women who are considered in the labor force. And so that's one of the ways in which you want to be a little bit mindful of thinking about this data. All right. So a next question, on many of my economic graphs, 
well, not mine, I want to say that for the record, small business activity and spending of different economic classes, there appears to be a blip upward around late May to mid-June. Is this the reopening of the majority of states? And the answer is no, it's not the reopening of the majority of states. It's uh, typically either payments going out or something else. Um, the, the, the reopening, it's really hard. And I, I know this is, a, this is a, a, a very controversial and in some ways very provocative claim. I'm surprised that even among conservative economists, uh, I, I know that there hasn't been more evidence that the reopening plans did, but in some ways their proponents or advocates said they did. Uh, the evidence seems to suggest that, you know, reopening plans have largely been stymied by the fact, bluntly, that high income households were not spending on the kinds of goods and services they were before opening or renote or no reopening. And to the extent that low income households that were dependent on that spending for jobs, that's not coming back. So this is consistent with this kind of bigger claim that I, one of the big lessons I really want folks to leave with today is that there is no cure, there's no economic recovery here without a solution to the pandemic, without, a, without dealing with the health crisis first. All right, next question. I wonder if the reduction in spending by those working from home is due to a reduction in keeping up with the Joneses factor. When working together in an office, one hears from others what new things they have bought, and you think that you may need that also. That could be. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the really interesting things to me as an economist is to think a little bit about how the culture of work is going to change. I mean, once it's possible to all go back, are we all going to go back? And if we all go back, how is culture going to change? What is the influence of other workers? It's, uh, perhaps less important now than things like spending on travel and food and entertainment and all of that other kind of stuff. In fact, there's some evidence that spending on some kinds of consumer durables have gone up. So I have no idea whether this is true, but uh, an economist friend of mine in the Midwest told me that in parts of the Midwest, spending on swimming pools is up. Um, could be true. Um, has, has the ring of truth to it. Um, and, and the story there would be, right, that, that, that households are now spending more on quote unquote home activities. Um, but yes, keeping up with the Joneses is a real issue. And I'll say that uh, uh, returning to the workplace is more than just kind of uh, um, conspicuous consumption culture, right? I mean, the, the workplace, in, workplace interaction is important for a lot of reasons, cultural, economic, social. and. I'm wondering exactly what we're talking, what we're going to see post COVID. Are we all going to come back and, and, and in some sense return to a culture we had before? And I don't know what the answer is. My, my sense is no. All right. So another question, uh, but I like the, the Jones question. So what is a K shape recovery? What does the K stand for? So the K doesn't stand for anything other than the fact that the, like all of the other descriptions of recoveries, the, the idea is that the recovery resembles the shape of the letter. And so by K, effectively, what we're talking about are now two paths, right? Um, so, you know, half the economy going up and half the economy going down, and that's where the K comes from. Um, and the half that's going up are, are, are typically high income workers, right, whose, whose uh, jobs have remained and whose spending is down a little bit and low income workers who basically still seem to be struggling. In fact, there's, there's really evidence that they're under enormous pressure and that, um, Pressures related to, for example, eviction are getting worse, not better. So I hope that answered the, the, the question about eviction. Um, all right. What information do you have about older workers leaving the workforce because of COVID? Who will replace these workers when the economy recovers? Great question. So yes, um, some part of what we're seeing when we look at unemployment data is the consequence of workers who are effectively, in, in, in the language of economists, they transition from in the labor force and employed to not in the labor force. And some part of that is indeed uh, older workers who are counted as leaving the labor force when they're no longer counted as looking. Uh, who will replace those workers? I don't know. This is a very interesting question. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk these days about the so-called labor force participation rates of especially uh, uh, older, older men, and, and they seem to have a collapse, started to collapse even before the uh, even before the COVID epidemic. 
Um, and so we don't know. I mean, a standard economics reason would be if in fact work becomes, you know, if, if firms really find themselves searching for work and, and, and workers are scarce because of the retirement of older workers, that wages will go up and people will then be drawn back into the labor force. Um, but that's a great question. And it's something we're watching actually right now. Um, all right, and I think I'm at the question at the top of the list which is, uh, since the Trump administration changed the agency to which COVID-19 statistics is required to report sometime in early August from the CDC to a private company, what is the current quality and accuracy of the coronavirus dashboard in the US? Great question. Um, and I'm gonna say that um, the problem, so I, I'll say that the problem is not specific to the United States. Um, uh, the quality of, of, of reporting data varies uh, a lot all over the world. Um, and with lots of countries having obviously pretty strong incentives to suppress some kinds of, of, of reports. Um, I, will, I would urge you in that context, if you're looking for the best possible data, I mentioned at the very start the Our World in Data folks, and one of the things that makes their exercise really more remarkable is they're trying very hard to recognize when this kind of stuff happens and then to calibrate, right? So for example, if reporting, if reporting rules change, then in principle, if we observe enough examples on both sides of that kind of change, we're able in some sense to correct for it, right? And so this this effort to make data commensurate across reporting regimes and across reporting agencies is a really difficult one. It's a big challenge for economists, um, but I think we're making some progress in that direction. So I'd really urge you to look at the Our World and Data site uh, for what I think of as, as absolutely the best data on, 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 on COVID death rates, COVID infection rates, um, new infection rates, and so on. The one thing I'll say is that it doesn't uh, typically disaggregate by the state level. Uh, it, it looks mostly nationally. All right, I'm seeing, have I done all of the Q&A? All right, I see, I'm, if I'm allowed to, I have Beth asking a question or two in the chat. So I'll take a look at both of those and then I'll take any more questions if people have them. So, um, so uh, in the chat I have, how long will it take for low wage earners to recover after there's a vaccine or will they recover to any great degree? And what will it take for small businesses to recover in the U.S. and Vermont? Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think I, the hope, obviously, right, is that the, the advent of a kind of a, a widely accepted and uh, a, a, a widely used, and this is a big issue, vaccine is going to bring the economy to some, back to something like where it was before. I'm not so sure, however. Um, you know, I think that at a minimum, I guess I would say this, my concern at this point is more about making sure that low wage workers make it through the next couple of months. And that's because there's frankly not nearly enough pressure on Congress to pass something that would rescue these workers, which still astonishes me, right? I mean, once upon a time, the months before an election was typically a period of time in which, you know, Congress went out of its way Right to 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 uh, to be generous to workers of all kinds, um, the notion that it, that you know, low wage workers have been abandoned still kind of puzzles me at some level. Um, so I my concern at this point is less about what they're going to look like when a vaccine happens than just getting them to the point where the vaccine actually manages. If if the spending of high income households recovers, my sense is that those jobs will come back. I think we're going to have a different conversation after that, however, about things like healthcare and other things. I, one more question from the chat and then one more from the Q&A. Uh, the UK's economy has declined the most. What lies, for he, what lies for them with Brexit on the horizon and likely a no-deal Brexit? Which country is likely to come out of the pandemic the strongest economically? Uh, so you're right, the UK has suffered a great deal um, and Brexit is not going to make things worse, uh, not, not going to make things any better. Um, you know, you look at the economies that have done relatively well, and they, at this point, they tend to look like the, the Nordic economies. Um, some part of the Brexit problem, and honestly, some part of the problem today right, the, the, with, the, with the news that President Trump and, uh, was infected is um, economies don't do well under clouds of uncertainty, right? It's one thing to say good or bad. It's another thing to say hugely uncertain. And in that environment, uh, Brexit is as much a problem because of the uncertainty it introduces as anything else. So 
Yeah, I have, a, I have a daughter who's kind of living through, uh, I, have one daughter, so I have one daughter in, in the UK right now and one daughter in Sweden. And so between the three of us, or my wife, the four of us, we are literally experimenting with four completely different approaches to the pandemic and the economy. Um, but all right, I'm seeing one more in the Q&A, is that right? Oh, two more in the Q&A. Well, <laughs> oh, I'd love a couple of these. Oh, I, I hope I have enough time to answer one of these. Um, all right, so um, so I'm Canadian living in the U.S. and want to know if the U.S. stats parallel the Canadian. Uh, so Canada looks a little better, um, but looks more like the U.S. than for, for it does other European countries um, for many of the same reasons, right? This kind of the, the notion of a, a, a trade-off, some resistance to the imposition of any kind of public health requirements or restrictions. Um, I'll give you an example, actually. So in Finland, right, which I showed you has a relatively uh, good economic performance, a relatively low numbers of death, um, you know, the kind of the, the sort of a high tech, vibrant high tech sector. One of those high tech companies came up with a kind of uh, uh, the equivalent of a kind of self self enforcing kind of tracing contact tracing uh, mechanism. This is to say everyone would kind of get download this app, everyone would kind of enter their status, and the company would so do whatever it needed to to assure privacy and what it would let you know is you know whether or not you were in the proximity of anyone with a positive diagnosis and what's charming is is that you can imagine basically that you know we, although they exist no one has proposed using them in the united states the day that it was introduced in finland a third of the population signed up so you know what are the what are the countries that are going to do well? The countries that are going to do well are the countries that limit the health consequences of this. I mean, it's it's that simple. Um, I'll answer one. I think I have time for one more. I have to answer this one where it has nothing to do with the talk, but somebody asked it, um, and I'd and I'd love to answer this feature. So, the question is, uh, why is economics called the dismal science? And I love this question uh, because you know after talks like this, people say you know, you're you're a really pretty de pretty depressing fellow. Um, but actually, I'm proud of that name. So I'm, I'm proud of that name because it was given to economics by Thomas Carlyle, who was a very conservative historian, British historian of the, of the early 19th century. And the reason he gave it to economics was, uh, you know, I'm not a big believer in Adam Smith, but you know, Adam Smith would tell these stories right about the benefits of, 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 of competition. And one of the things he would say is that, you know, competition was was able to erase prejudices. Every single person could can some way stand on their own. And 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 the notion that somehow we were all equal in some way really offended Carlyle. Carlyle thought we were a dismal science because we we harbor these crazy illusions of equality. And that we weren't willing to recognize the kind of the realities of the world out there. And so I'm, in that sense, I'm super proud to call myself a dismal science scientist. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing at least one other person come on, so I'm going to stop there. Is that okay for everyone? Peter, thank you so much. We do not consider you dismal. I'm sorry. <laughs> With, that was a fascinating discussion. Really, really worthwhile. Perfect time. Thank you again. Thank you very much.